the Hubble Space Telescope uh, is an amazing instrument. Uh, it's had an, um, an immense impact on how we understand our universe. It's taken images of things from galaxies at the far edge of our universe right down to Mars uh, and everything in between. It, its images you know, inspire us, they amaze us, and occasionally they even amuse us. <laughs> so the universe is smiling back at you. Um, but this image is actually very scientifically important as well as being a neat, uh, a neat little smiley face. These yellowish galaxies are relatively nearby galaxies, and they're mature. They have sort of normal stars like we'd see in our, scar in our sky right now, um, things that are you know, millions to billions of years old, and so they're, they're very mature galaxies. The gravity from these galaxies acts as a lens so that galaxies behind, other galaxies behind them are actually focused by the gravity uh, from these older, older galaxies. Why this is important is these streaks that make up our smiley face are very young galaxies much, that we see much farther back in time. They're, they're, they started to form closer to the beginning of the universe, you know, near the Big Bang. And so these brightish blue, blue streaks are where the stars are being formed in these galaxies. Part of the reason this is so important is the gravity lens makes them appear brighter than they would otherwise, which means that with our telescopes, they're easier for us to see. And until this spring, in fact, the farthest galaxies that we knew about were all these gravitationally lensed galaxies. This was the only way we could see them. Then in March, it was announced, um, well, I should back up, one of the things that Hubble has done is taken a number of deep fields. These are regions of sky that we thought were pretty blank, but Hubble pointed at them for many, many hours, took many hours of exposures. And when we look at them, we see fields that look like this. Almost everything in this image is a galaxy, except for that one star sitting right there. Everything else is a galaxy. When we looked carefully at this image, there is a little speck that when you zoom it in, looks like a blob. And my wife would say everything I look at is a fuzzy blob. But it's this, this little galaxy that turns out to have formed about 300 million years after the Big Bang. It's very, very far away. It happens to be very bright. It's intrinsically bright. And so we could detect it with Hubble. Most of the others, we have to rely on the universe lensing it for us, using other galaxies as telescopes to help us see these things. But these are some of the breakthroughs that Hubble has helped us make um, when we're trying to understand the far universe. This is actually one of my favorite pictures that Hubble has taken. This, this is a planetary nebula. This is a nearby star within our own galaxy that's at the end of, nearing the end of its life. Um, stars, as they age, if they're massive enough, if they're big enough, start to blow off their outer layers. Stars are kind of like onions, they have layers. Um, but at, at the end phases, they become a little unstable and they start you know, the energy from the star starts pushing those outer layers away. Occasionally, if there's two stars in here, so the old dying star and another star that's orbiting with it, it can shape the planetary nebulae and it produces these beautiful structures. This is called the Twin Jet Nebula um, so because it looks like it has jets of material shooting away both directions. And one of the things I like about this image, not only because it's pretty, it has lots of neat colors, but if you look carefully, you'll notice there are some bright spots in here on both sides. I think what's going on, and I haven't talked to the scientists that done, have done these observations, but what, what they think is going on is that there's a lot of material near that star, um, you know, a lot of dust and, and material that blew off from the star that's condensing, but it's kind of patchy, like clouds in the sky. And so if you go out some night where it's partly cloudy and see the sunset, there are rays of sunlight that, that burst through little patches in the clouds. Well, I think that's what's going on here. So there's starlight that's escaping through those little patches and then lighting up the walls with a little, little more starlight than, than other places are getting. Um, and then just the overall structure, the fact that you see all this fine detail, it's really a spectacular image, and you know, I do think it's very pretty. So Hubble has done, you know, this is the, the amazing and inspiring part. 
To talk about a successor to Hubble, I actually have to talk a little bit about another space telescope. This is the Spitzer Space Telescope that was launched in 2003, and that was actually a, minute, a mission managed here uh, at JPL. Spitzer also looked at some of those deep fields that Hubble looked at, and this is, this is one of them, not the same one I showed you before, but it's another one. Every one of these little red dots in here is a galaxy that Spitzer detected um, again, that's very far away, uh, very young in terms of the age of the universe. And what they found is there are far more of these galaxies than we had expected. To have this many galaxies within a few hundred million years of the Big Bang <laughs> implies that the process of forming galaxies happens very early. We, we might have expected that you'd form a few stars first, and then more stars would form, and eventually there would be enough of them that the gravity between the stars would start making galaxies. But this, this implies that, you know, that one at a time sort of thing isn't the way it works. Some, you know, somehow we form galaxies and stars almost at the same time, very early on. Some people know what images with infrared cameras look like, and they're not often very good. So you know, people wonder, well, can an infrared telescope take pretty pictures? Well, the answer is yes. Uh, this is an image from the Spitzer Space Telescope of a star-forming region. You see a lot of young stars in a cluster here near the most. There's a lot of material right here that forms stars, and it's just a very, very impressive picture. So yes, infrared telescopes can take pretty pictures too. Well, looking at the results of Spitzer and of Hubble, um, astronomers actually 20 years ago already started asking, what do we do after Hubble? Um, what, what science questions do we think will still be out there that we need something even more than Hubble can help us understand? And so over the years, uh, scientists collected results that they were obtaining and said, okay, well, here's some of the open questions. And so there were four science themes, four science goals that were, were set you know, before the people designing the Webb Space Telescope and said, here's what we want to be able to do, and here's what they are. Um, we want to discover and confirm the light, first light-emitting objects in the universe. So right after the Big Bang, stars had to start forming somehow. How did that happen? Um, we'd like to see what those stars look like, what their properties are. Uh, next, we'd like to understand how those early galaxies formed. If they didn't form from you know, pulling stars together, just how did that process work? Um, in that Spitzer image that I showed you, a lot of those galaxies aren't the big things that we see nearby us today. They're these little clumps of stars, you know, you know, maybe hundreds of thousands of, of stars forming that little galaxy. And so they had to merge somehow. How did that work? Um, we'd like to look at the earliest steps of the birth of stars, even in our own galaxy. Um, we'll talk about why you need infrared telescopes to, to study star formation, but we want more information on how they work. We want to see the stars that are, you know, 1,000 years old to 10,000 years old. What we typically see now is in the hundreds of thousands of years range. And then finally, planets form around stars. Uh, thanks to the Kepler telescope, we now know of thousands of planets that orbit stars in that, those particular patches of sky. We'd like to know more about those planets. What can we say about how the planets evolved? Um, and ultimately, if we're lucky, you know, do they have conditions that would support life? So these are some of the things that we'd like the Webb telescope to help us address. And this is the concept they came up with. Um, I'll just point out a couple of things before we move along. All telescopes have a primary mirror. All large telescopes have a primary mirror that collects the light. So light comes in from your object. It reflects off that primary mirror bounces off a small secondary mirror that relays the light back through a hole in the primary mirror. And then there are scientific instruments that sit behind the mirror um, that either collect it as images or break it into uh, spectra where we can study what the composition of the sources are. There's a big tennis court sized sun shield. That's that diamond shaped structure. This protects the telescope from sunlight and earth light uh, because both of them are bad for our scientific observations. And then not visible underneath is a spacecraft bus that has the propulsion systems and all that, all that sort of stuff. The difference between Webb and Hubble is primarily size, um, but there are a few more details. Uh, that primary mirror of Hubble, the light collecting mirror up here, is about 2.4 meters in diameter, roughly eight feet in diameter. 
if you draw a circle around the primary mirror of the James Webb Space Telescope, it's about six and a half meters in diameter. That's cheating a little bit because part of the mirror is missing. So on average, it's about a six meter mirror and that's a lot easier to say. Um, but you'll notice there are 18 hexagonal segments that make up the primary mirror. So not only does each individual mirror have to be very precisely shaped, we have to be able to get all 18 mirrors to work together as one large mirror. You'll also notice that the Hubble Space Telescope has a shield that baffles it against stray light, whereas Webb is wide open. So if there's any, any sources off to the side that are shining into the telescope, um, we will see them. So while Webb is bigger than Hubble, it's, it's not a replacement. Early on, we heard people talking about, oh, there's a replacement for Hubble. Well, not really. Um, Webb is designed to complement and extend with what both Hubble and Spitzer have been able to do. And the key feature of Webb, in order to do that, is it has to work at infrared wavelengths. Um, so I'm going to explain a little bit about what the infrared is, why it's important, why it's really neat, why I do it. Um, if we shine, I should have waited, if we shine a white light through a prism, you know, we get the rainbow thing. You know, we've all seen that. You've seen rainbows in the sky. It's the same principle. It's very natural to ask, well, what's over here? What's past the violet? We also might ask, well, what's over here? What's, what's below the red? William Herschel in 1800 did an experiment where he was trying to measure the temperature of the colors of light. He thought that maybe you know, individual colors might have a different temperature. It was a good experiment to try to do. So what he did is he put a thermometer over here and another thermometer over here as his controls and then moved the thermometer through the different colors of light. Well, what he noticed was that the purple light was coldest and the red light was warmest. So he did what a good scientist would do and said, well, gee, if it's warmest here, what if I move off just to the side a little bit? I should see the temperature drop, right? Well, it turned out that, that dark space below the red was the warmest of all, and that's the discovery of infrared radiation or infrared light. And that was the first time we actually discovered energy that, you know, light energy that we couldn't see with our eyes. So it was a huge, it was a huge thing. And it took a long time to develop instruments that would work in the infrared, but it came along eventually. What can we do with infrared light? Well, we can take pictures of meerkats. I'm not sure where this visible wavelength picture was taken. But this is what meerkats look like in the thermal infrared. And I think this is a lot of fun. You can actually learn a lot about meerkats based on an infrared image of the meerkats because you notice the eyes are bright. Um, your eyes are, are deep in your head. They're surrounded by very warm tissue. And so they're going to be warmer than average. Uh, their noses, on the other hand, are dark. You know, your nose sticks out a little bit. And so it cools off a little bit more, and then there's not as much blood, blood supply in your nose. So it actually looks a little bit cooler. Actually, if you go over to the Von Karman um, Museum just next door, there's a thermal infrared camera there, and you can see what your own face looks like. And it won't look like a meerkat, but it will have some of the same features. Uh, you also notice that their toes are cold because they're on the rocks that don't generate heat on their own. And so, you know, maybe we don't learn a lot about meerkats in the infrared, but we see some of the things. And the gaps in fur are brighter because you can see down closer to their skin, and so that's why their fur looks so funny. Well, there are more important uses for infrared, and one of them is firefighting. Um, if you're in a room full of smoke, it's hard to see anything. But infrared wavelengths, or smoke, is actually relatively transparent to infrared wavelengths. So if we look at this scene with an infrared camera, we see there's a person on the floor uh, that needs to be rescued. And so, same sort of thing. He's got a bright face because there's a lot of blood in your face. The clothing is a little bit cooler. I thought it was cool the oxygen tank on the back of the firefighter is, is relatively cold compared to everything else, and so it's very dark. So this demonstrates a couple of things that we can take advantage of in the infrared. We can see the temperatures of things. We can see warm and cold. And we can also see through smoke. Well, we can use those same things in astronomy to help us understand the universe around us. Uh, this is a little cloud of gas and dust that's zipping around in our own galaxy. It's fairly close to us. All the stars you see here are farther away than the clouds, so there should just be a carpet of stars all over this. 
But because the dust in the cloud absorbs visible wavelength light the same way that smoke absorbs light, we can't see through the cloud. But if we get an infrared camera and take another image of that cloud, we can see those stars through it. So it turns out there's not much going on in this cloud. It's, it's just kind of quiet, sitting there, not doing much of anything. This is a visible wavelength image of a patch of sky in the constellation Cassiopeia. Um, we see a couple of cool things in here. There's, there's a star that must be emitting a lot of ultraviolet light, and it's causing some gas around it to glow. That's why it has that red color. But in the rest of the, rest of the frame, you see there's some dark streaks uh, along the edges over here. And it's not because there are not stars there. The stars aren't missing. There's stuff in front of the stars blocking the light. So if we take an infrared image of the same area, we see a number of things popping up. First of all, there's a lot of dust that's glowing brightly in here. But all these very red stars suddenly pop into our field of view. Well, stars form in clouds of gas and dust. So these clouds, there's, there's enough material there that gravity pulls that dust together and heats up and begins to form stars. And so these are the stars that I were talking about. These are the things that are, you know, kind of 10,000 years old, sort of the baby stars. And we can't see them any other way than in the infrared because the dust absorbs them. And so with our infrared cameras, if we want to study star how stars form, this is how we do it. We, we go into the infrared. You'll notice this little box over here that still has a visible wavelength image. If I put the infrared part in there, you see this big ring of uh, gas and dust. There was a supernova there in 1572, Tycho supernova, that blew out this shell of material, but the material is actually still very cold. So the only way we see it is at infrared wavelengths where, where we detect the heat from it. Now, it's much colder than room temperature, but it's warm enough that we can see it. So in this image, we demonstrated those two features of the infrared that we like. We can see through dust, and we can also see very cold objects. So there's one more scientific technique I need to talk a little bit about, and that's spectroscopy, taking the spectrum of a source. So if you remember when we, we shone white light through the prism, we got that colored rainbow, so we got all the colors from the white light. If I take a tube of hydrogen gas and pass an electric current through it, it turns the hydrogen into a plasma, and it glows this kind of uh, pinkish, purplish color. Well, if I look at that tube through a prism, what I'll see is multiple images of the tube, but I only see very discrete, discrete colors. I don't see a full rainbow. Well, it turns out all atoms have this sort of, have a signature, a thumbprint. And so if I measure the wavelength of those lines, I always see these lines at these wavelengths. So if, if I look at something and I see a wavelength of 656 nanometers, I know right away that that came from hydrogen. Um, the neat thing is, if I have hot gas, hot hydrogen, it glows at those specific colors. If I have a cold container of hydrogen and put it in front of a white light source, I see absorption, I see dark lines at exactly those same wavelengths. So whether I have hot hydrogen glowing on its own or whether I have cold hydrogen that's absorbing background starlight, I know there's hydrogen there. I mentioned every element has its own fingerprint. So hydrogen is a very simple atom, one proton, one electron, and so it has a very simple set of lines that it emits. Helium has two protons, two neutrons, two electrons. It's a bit more complex. As we get heavier and heavier, we get more lines and more complexity, but they are all a very unique fingerprint. So if I look at a star and I take its spectrum, I can figure out what's there just by looking for all these fingerprints. And in fact, if I take a spectrum of the sun, this is what it looks like. You know, normally if you just, well, you shouldn't look at the sun, but if you do look at the sun, you know, it's kind of a whitish, yellowish, you don't see anything particularly funny, but if you look at it through a high-resolution spectrograph, this is what you see. And there's a big notch over in the red wavelengths. And I said, aha, hydrogen has an absorption line at red wavelengths, so I know the sun has hydrogen in it. And in fact, people that do this for a living uh, say there are 69 elements that we've discovered uh, in sunlight. Uh, hydrogen accounts for 92.1% of the atoms in the sun. 
uh, helium for 7.8%, and everything else, those other 67 elements, uh, form le less than 0.1% of the sun's surface. But we know it's there, mostly hydrogen, a little bit of helium, and that's a common refrain whenever we look at stars. Another thing that spectra tell us is they can tell us how fast an object is moving. Um, you've all heard a siren coming toward you. The pitch of the siren sounds higher than when it's stationary right next to you. And if it goes whizzing past you, the pitch is lower. It's the Doppler shift. Well, light does exactly the same thing. And so if I have my laboratory spectrum you know, sitting right in front of me and I compare it to the spectrum of a star, the lines are pretty much the same place. This, this drawing exaggerates it a little bit, but you know, in general, you know, stars are at rest compared with us in the grand scheme of things, and so the wavelengths are all the same. But for galaxies that are nearby, and then some that are not so nearby, they're all receding from us because the universe is expanding. And so the wavelength of those lines shifts toward the red. And so we call this the red shift. Um, so this galaxy actually isn't that far away. We'd say that that had a redshift of about a third, 0.3. That galaxy I showed you at the very beginning, that fuzzy little blob, has a redshift of 11, which means that the wavelength of light has been shifted a factor of 12 from what it would be in the laboratory. So that means that visible light from that galaxy has now been shifted way into the mid-infrared, just where my MIRI instrument works. And so if we want to see galaxies near the fringe of the universe, we have to look in the infrared to see the light that we're used to seeing in nearby galaxies. OK, just a quick side note. As pretty as the rainbows are, they really aren't very useful in terms of analyzing things. So we plot the brightness of the spectrum as a function of wavelength. So you always see plots. And so where there's a bright line, that's a spike on this spectrum. And if, if there were a spike downward, that would tell you there's an absorption line there. That's important because when we work in the infrared, we don't get rainbows because our eyes don't see that. This is a very young star. This is one of these baby stars that I'm interested in. And uh, baby stars tend to be very messy, just like human babies. They tend to burp up bubbles of stuff and uh, throw things around. Um, but we'd like to get a spectrum of this thing just to understand what kind of material is there. If we do, this is an infrared spectrum. I should have said that at visible wavelengths, we see mostly atoms. At infrared wavelengths, we see mostly molecules. Uh, you know, they're larger. They have, tend to have lower energy states that we're looking at. So this is a spectrum of that baby star. There's a big absorption feature here that's labeled silicates. Silicates are a type of rock. If you go down to Santa Monica Beach, you're surrounded by silicates. Sand grains are, are, are a form of, of silicates. There are also things like water ice, a little bit of carbon dioxide ice. And there's even a little bit of methane gas here. Now, being a good scientist, I employ my prodigious powers of scientific reasoning and come to the very firm conclusion that there are cows in space. <laughs> Okay, this is a joke. I don't want this to show up in the tabloids tomorrow. A top NASA scientist did not announce the discovery of cows in space. But it's, it's important because these are the molecules that are important for life on Earth. And so it's good, maybe reassuring, that the, the molecules that we depend on here are actually relatively common in space. And so it helps us understand how our solar system formed, you know, how, you know, when stars form, they form out of the same stuff that we find on Earth that drives life here. Another thing that we can learn from infrared light is as we start studying planets around nearby stars, you know, we'd like to study their atmospheres and whether they're rocky or whether they're like Earth or whether they're gaseous like Jupiter. So if we know that we've got a star and a planet with a planet orbiting the star, we can't, we can't separate them. So we can't take an image, usually we can't take an image of here's the star, here's the planet. Generally, we only see the light from both of them together. Um, but if we know that a planet crosses in front of a star transit, uh, maybe you've heard about the Venus transit a couple of years back where Venus passed in front of the face of the sun. When a planet f passes in front of the star, it blocks some of the light, and so the apparent intensity of the star drops a little bit. 
But then there's a phase where we see both of them together before the planet hides behind the star at the other end. But this part is interesting because if there's a big difference in temperature of the planet between the daytime side of the planet and the nighttime side of the planet, we'll actually see a little bit more infrared or a little bit less infrared um, depending on where the planet is in its orbit. So if we're seeing the backside night, nighttime side of the planet, there's a little less light as it swings around to the day side, you know, from our, from our view, it's actually a little brighter. So the fact that the, <clears throat> the light from the planet and star rose a little bit as we went to the, to the daytime side tells us that there's a pretty good temperature difference between the, the day side and the night side of this planet. And so it probably doesn't have a really thick atmosphere like Venus. It's something a little bit more transparent, maybe like ours. Um, so that's, that's exciting. Hey, we found out a little, bit as, a little bit about this other planet. We've been able to do a little bit with atmospheres of planets. Um, this is a, a model spectrum of, a, of an atmosphere. And this is what the Spitzer Space Telescope was able to observe. It was only able to look at this in three different colors. And they noticed that it was a little bit dimmer at 3.8 microns, and they thought it should be in a little bit brighter out here at 6 microns. And so they, they fit that atmospheric model and said, yeah, this might be able to work. Um, one of the things that the Webb Telescope will do, it will actually let us get this spectrum. And so maybe we'll actually see that curve and confirm that the atmosphere really worked that way. So if the infrared is so neat, and I hope I convinced you that it is, uh, it's really a lot of fun to play with, why doesn't everybody in the world and their dog have an infrared telescope in their backyard? Well, there are three things that make this a difficult place to <laughs> have your career. Uh, first is room temperature emission, and I'll explain what I mean. Second thing is the atmosphere, and I'll explain what that means. And then third, just the sensors that we use uh, for infrared astronomy um, can cause a fair amount of trouble on their own. Any object that's at a finite temperature emits radiation with a very characteristic spectrum, and we call this a black body spectrum. Stars that are extremely hot, 10,000 to 100,000 degrees, actually emit most of their light in ultraviolet wavelengths. Um, more normal stars like the sun emit most of their light at visible wavelengths, which makes sense because that's what our eyes see, and so it makes sense for our eyes to have adapted to what our star puts out. So, that's why we have visible wavelengths, and that's where the sun emits. Those clouds of gas and dust that I mentioned where we form stars, they tend to be very cold, uh, you know, 15 to 30 degrees above absolute zero. So they actually emit most of their light, their radiation, at, at the very long far infrared wavelengths. And then the cosmic microwave background, which is a little bit under 3 degrees above absolute zero, emits in the millimeter. That leaves this nice curve in the middle. That red curve is in the mid-infrared. It's wavelengths around 10 microns, exactly where my instrument works. And that's where the Earth emits, and where the atmosphere emits, and where astronomers emit. Um, everything in the mid-infrared is glowing. Um, one, of, one of the infrared astronomers quoted, observing in the infrared is like observing in broad daylight with a telescope made out of light bulbs. Um, <laughs> Where do the stars go during the day? They're still there, right? Stars don't move compared to us very much. So they're still there, but we can't see them because the Earth's atmosphere scatters blue light from the sun, and the, the glow of that scattered light just washes out our ability to see stars. If you got a telescope out in the middle of the day, you actually could see a few stars, but it's really hard because the sky is so bright. Well, that's what it is like all the time in the mid-infrared. So when I said I built instruments that went on Keck and on Palomar, we were fighting the atmospheric glow. It didn't matter if we were observing daytime or nighttime. It's always bad. Um, so that's one reason why we want to put things in space. Second is our Earth's atmosphere isn't very cooperative. That same atmosphere that makes it possible for us to be alive also likes to make it difficult for infrared astronomers. At visible wavelengths in, in this range, most of the light gets through the atmosphere down to the ground, and so that's why big telescopes on the ground work. But there are certain wavelengths where molecules in our atmosphere absorb all the light, and so the atmosphere is actually opaque at those wavelengths. Um, 
A lot of it's just from water vapor, some of it's carbon dioxide. There's even a little bit of absorption from ozone in our atmosphere. Well, the weathermen love this because they build satellites that observe at six microns. And if you've ever gone to uh, NOAA website or Wonderground or whatever, uh, you might have seen water vapor maps that tell us where the storms are, where all the water uh, moisture is. So there's a big band of moisture blowing up through uh, northern Mexico and Texas. Um, Southern California is a little drier. There's a big band out over the ocean just north of the Hawaiian Islands where there's very little water vapor, and so you see all the way down to the surface of the Earth. That's why it's so dark. So weathermen like it. Astronomers on the ground, not so much. And then finally, the sensors themselves. It sounds a little funny, but if you have a sensor that's temp uh, sensitive to temperature, the sensor has to be colder than the stuff it's trying to detect, otherwise it detects itself. So we have to cool things in the infrared to very cold temperatures, and if you do that in the air, air freezes on your detectors and that messes everything up. Um, there are also some false signals that are generated by the detectors, and so we have to get them even colder. Most of the three of the instruments on James Webb need to be cooled to 40 degrees above absolute zero to work. MIRI, the instrument I work on, needs to be cooled to about six degrees above absolute zero in order to work. So all those things together, the radiation of room temperature things, the atmosphere, and just our sensors, really does mean we want to put our infrared telescopes up in space uh, so we can see what's going on. So to address the scientific questions, to make things work in the infrared, we're building the Webb telescope. So Webb is a six-meter infrared optimized telescope. Uh, you'll notice the primary mirror is coated with gold rather than silver. Gold is actually a better reflector of infrared wavelengths than silver is. Uh, it has four instruments that cover 0.7 to 28 microns. Now, I know that doesn't mean much, but the reddest color your eyes can see is right about 0.7 microns. So James Webb takes off right where your vision fails, uh, so into the infrared past that. Um, Webb is a partnership between NASA, the European Space Agency, and the Canadian Space Agency. None of us can go it alone. We've got to work together on this stuff. And it's going to be launched on a European Ariane 5 rocket. Now, you saw the picture of Webb sitting in the clean room at Goddard, all, all unfolded. That does not fit in any rocket currently in production. We've got to fold it up. And so you'll notice that three of the mirror panels on this side and three on the other side fold back. That secondary mirror that's supposed to be out here is up on top. Uh, the sunshade is folded up, like, you know, kind of like butterfly wings tucked in there. And so James Webb Space Telescope is an origami telescope. It's got to unfold. After it launches, the fairing separates, things begin to expand. So first we got to get our solar panels out so we can get power. Um, there's a lock on the antenna. We pitch the telescope a little bit and we do some course corrections. A long course correction, apparently. Uh, pitch back a little bit. We extend our antenna so we can establish high-speed communications with the Earth. It's all low speed up to that point. Another little course correction. Then we begin to unfold stuff. So first we're going to start with that sun shield. Uh, so first these, the structures that actually hold the sun shield fold back from the telescope. Uh, we do the front side first. Then the back side comes down. Now to help the telescope clear that sun shield, the telescope itself is actually on a tower that separates it from the rest of the spacecraft, and that tower has to extend about six feet in order that nothing in that sunshade touches the telescope. So that was a tower deployment. The covers come off the top of the sun shield. This is all packaged like some little tinfoil wrapping thing. Um, we release a couple of locks. And then these booms deploy that stretch out that sun shield from where it's folded up in the center. 
So we do one side first, then the other side. Now that sun shield is actually five layers of material, um, and it's very important that those five layers separate because on the sun side, the temperature of this first layer is about room temperature, about 300 degrees above absolute zero. But the telescope needs to be 50 degrees above absolute zero, so this top shade has to be 50. So if there's any touching in between, it will heat up the, the next layer and we won't get cold enough. Um, so that's one of the, our big concerns. Now we're getting ready to release the secondary mirror. So you can see the structure starting to move. Then the secondary mirror, which is here, swings forward and moves to the front of the primary mirror. And then finally, the side wings of the telescope primary mirror move into position. Here comes the other side. That whole process takes two weeks. <laughs> so the Mars guys had seven minutes of terror while they were trying to land a rover on Mars. We got two weeks of terror um, waiting for our telescope to deploy. After it's fully unfolded, then begins the long process of the t whole telescope has to cool down. Our instruments have to cool down. Until everything is settled, we've, we've made sure everything works. We, we do our calibrations. It's six months after launch before we're ready to start taking scientific data. So it's a long one. Um, another thing different uh, between uh, Webb and Hubble is where it's located in space. Hubble actually orbits the Earth just a few hundred miles up, so it actually orbits the Earth every 90 minutes. And some, some evenings when, when Hubble goes overhead, you can watch it streak across the sky. Webb is going to be located a million miles from Earth, four times the distance of the moon. There, there are five spots um, between the Earth and the sun where the gravity of the Earth and sun balance the tendency of the spacecraft to go running off on its own. And these are called Lagrange points after the mathematician who discovered them. The second Lagrange point, nicknamed L2, is actually a really nice place to put spacecraft because our sun shield will always shield the Earth, the moon, and the sun from shining on the telescope. Um, we've sent a number of spacecraft out there. Uh, Webb will be, joining, will be joining the collection. So I mentioned Webb has four instruments, so I'd like to describe them very quickly. NearCam is our near-infrared camera. Uh, it's primary to, primarily to take pictures of things. Um, it has a tool called a coronagraph, which I'll explain in a second, and it does some very simple spectroscopy. So the, the top is some images from the Hubble Space Telescope with the wide field uh, camera number three, which has limited infrared uh, capabilities. Um, if we were to image the same galaxy with Webb, um, not only do we see fainter galaxies around it because we have so much more collecting area, but we begin to see some of the spots that are just sort of fuzzy in the Hubble image. Um, and again, this is a simulation. <laughs> we don't have anything yet. Um, but these spots you know, might be regions where stars are being actively formed, or they might be remnants of those little galaxies that collided, that merged together to form a larger galaxy. But that's the kind of stuff we want to find out with Webb. And so it will be a great tool for, for examining these very early galaxies. A coronagraph is an instrument that blocks the starlight. So whatever's right in the center of the coronagraph, the light from that gets blocked. So we'll put a star right in the center. And so where the star was gets blocked out so we don't see the starlight at all. But that allows us to see other structures around the star that normally are lost in, this, in the glare. The star is so bright that we can't see these things. This is a star called Beta Pictoris, and we saw these, um, this kind of disk structure. And we said, in our solar system, we have a similar sort of thing. We have zodiacal light, which is dust near the Earth, that on a good dark night out in the desert, you might be able to see as a band of light. Well, this is much thicker than, than in our own solar system, but we said, hey, you know, that's, that's kind of a signature of a solar system. I wonder if there are planets in there. Well, a few years later, after our coronagraphs improved, we have a coronagraph which is much tighter, and we noticed there was a spot. 
um, next to that star. And it turned out they imaged it again six months later, and this, this, that spot was on the other side of the star. Um, turns out this is a planet. Um, so it, it has, a, I don't remember what the period is, some number of years. Um, but we saw it in part of its orbit, and it'll, it'll go around for quite a while before it gets all the way around. Um, but with these chronographs, we can actually take direct images of planets. So if the planet is far enough from the star, you know, we might be able to detect it. And so that's something that people are very, very eager to do with, with the Webb telescope. Uh, NearSpec is our big spectrometer. A uh, couple interesting things about it. It has two ways of making a spectrum. It uses micro shutters, and it has an integral field unit, which are really technical terms, but I'll explain what they mean. With a micro shutter, it's like shutters that you put on your windows. You know, you have all the slats, and you can open some of the slats if it's maybe broken, <laughs> to let in light from one slat and not the others. So if we have, a, have an image of galaxies on the sky, we can put the micro shutter array in front of them, and then we can choose which shutters to open so that we get spectra of just the galaxies that we're interested in. So here we've opened a few, uh, few shutters, and maybe that one corresponds to that galaxy, this one to that one, and that to that. I don't know. The drawing wasn't very good. But the point is we can get spectra of those three galaxies at exactly the same time. In fact, we can do up to 100 at one time, which when you have a big expensive telescope, it's good to do as many things at the same time as you can. So this is one way to get information on many different objects. So that's, that's what we call the micro shutter array um, with the spectrometer. The other thing, the integral field unit, takes a, a, a tiny square of sky and slices it up. So it uses a special mirror that has these steps on it so that the top slice gets put into the spectrometer on the left edge, the next slice next to it, and so forth. So we spread these six slices out and get the spectra simultaneously. And so it's another way to get information over a larger area all at one time. The neat, one of the neat things you can do with this is if you put such a, an integral field unit on a galaxy, remember I talked about red shifts and blue shifts? You can see those Doppler shifts in the stars and the galaxy. And so we can actually tell which way the galaxy is rotating. This top galaxy, the lower end is coming toward us. It's blue shifted. The top end is moving away from us uh, from the red shift. This galaxy is sort of the same thing. So in both of these galaxies, we see strong signatures of rotation. We can tell how fast it's rotating, which tell us, tells us how big the galaxy is. And so it's an important tool for understanding those galaxies you know, at the far fringes, you know, understanding how they formed. The fine guidance sensor nearest is actually sort of two, two instruments in one. Um, I should have said NearCam is being built, was built by the University of Arizona, and NearSpec was built by the European Space Agency. Uh, FGS nearest is built by the Canadian Space Agency. Uh, it serves as the fine guidance sensor to help us actually point the telescope and lock onto stars. Um, the near infrared imager and slitless spectrograph is, is sort of a specialized in, imager and spectrograph. It doesn't duplicate what the other two near infrareds do, infrared instruments do. One of the neat things that it does do is it has the ability to take spectra of the same fields in two different directions. So there's a pair of stars here, and in this image, the starlight is spread horizontally. The same two stars are over here. In this way, the light is spread vertically. What's the big deal? Well, if you're getting spectra of all these objects at the same time, it's inevitable that two stars, the spectra overlap each other one direction. But when I get the spectra in the other direction, they're well separated. And so one image or the other will give me a good spectrum of the sources that I'm interested in. OK, finally, the fourth instrument. This is MIRI. This is, this is the instrument that we've been working on here at JPL. The other three instruments all work from about 1 to 5 microns. MIRI works 5 to 28 microns. Because we're the only instrument that works at these wavelengths, we have to do all the things that the other instruments do. So we have an imaging capability, we have chronographs, and we have a spectrometer. I forgot to point out, at JPL, we were responsible for the detectors. And every image of MIRI that I can find on the web, they always hide my detectors. So, Gratuitous self-promotion. This is what one of the JPL-led detectors actually looks like. 
yes, that's me. You can tell by the eyebrows. Um, <laughs> This is Kalyani Sakatmi, who was until recently our project manager. Uh, so this was early on when we first delivered the detectors to be bolted onto the rest of the instrument. Um, a few words on why we want a mid-infrared instrument in the first place. If we can learn a lot from the near-infrared instruments, why do we need a mid-infrared instrument? Near-infrared, we detect mostly the ultraviolet light from those galaxies that are you know, very far away that have been redshifted from ultraviolet to the near infrared. Well, the visible light from those galaxies gets redshifted into the mid infrared. So, if we want to study the normal stars in those really far away galaxies, we need to look at them in the mid infrared. Um, we see mostly atoms and molecules in high energy conditions, high temperatures uh, in the near infrared. We see molecules in lower energy conditions in the mid infrared. If we look at stars that are forming planets, um, we see the more mature stars in the mid-infrared. If you want to see the very young stars that are still themselves in the process of forming, we see that in the mid-infrared. And finally, if you're looking at the planets themselves in the near-infrared, we tend to see the really hot stars that are close, or really hot planets that are close to the stars, things that are 1,000 degrees, someplace we definitely don't want to visit. Um, if you want to study planets that are more room temperature, more like the Earth, then we'll want to look at those in the mid-infrared. There are many, many more reasons, but these are a few of the things that are important. A little bit more about MIRI. All the other instruments were built, or at least there was one organization responsible for the, for the instrument. With MIRI, it was a 50-50 partnership from the beginning. Um, JPL it was responsible for half the instrument the detectors, the electronics to run the detectors, and the cooler that gets us down to that six Kelvin temperature were all the responsibility of JPL. 24 astronomical institutes in 10 different European countries were responsible for the optics and the structure of the instrument. And when this was first proposed to our senior management here at JPL, they all shook their head and said, it's never gonna work. I'm pleased to say it worked actually very, very well. Uh, we had great people on both sides of the pond, so to speak, and uh, I think we have a really great instrument. What do I want to look at myself? Um, you know, in the introduction, uh, Mark explained that I'm interested in star formation. I do have a little bit of time of my own on web where I can point it at anything I please. Um, and so what do I want to look at? Well. I got some questions. I'd like to understand how binary stars form. About half the stars that you see in the nighttime sky are actually binaries, two stars that are orbiting each other. When we look at very young stars, the stars that are still in the process of forming, it's more like 80 to 90% of them. So why do stars form as binaries and then lose their companions along the way? So I'd like to understand a little bit more about those binaries. Also, I mentioned that planetary nebulae with you know, that kind of wing, you know, that low wing-shaped structure, generally need binary stars to form structures like that. So the common theme is binary stars. So I'd like to know a little bit more about what shapes, those planetary, what shapes the planetary nebulae. This is a very young star. It's actually a triple system. So there are three stars here. The bluish color of these two stars generally indicate that they are hotter um, they might even be almost normal stars. Whereas this yellow reddish color, because this is a mid infrared image, this, this we would normally interpret as a very young star. Well, if they're gravitationally bound to each other, they had to have formed at the same time. So, how is it that you can have two older looking stars and a younger looking star? If you get crude spectra of these stars, the two top sources are the white and red curves up here. They're they're kind of normal and flat. You know, this is relative to a normal star spectrum. So they look about normal. But this yellowish star is much, has much more infrared radiation than, than getting toward the visible. So it's, it's much colder in apparent temperature. But the important thing is that the solid lines were data that was taken at one period of time. And then the dashed lines was three years later. So these two stars stayed roughly constant. But this star actually, not only did it get brighter at short wavelengths, the temperature actually got apparently hotter. So what's going on? So one of the ideas 
is that that gas and dust that forms the stars is still streaming onto that star. And as it falls onto the star, it heats up and causes the changes in temperatures and so forth. So with Webb, I'd like to study that a little bit more. I should be able to see material actually around the star, perhaps flowing in uh, into that star. On the planetary nebula side, this, this is a different planetary nebula called the Egg Nebula. The, the image on the right was taken with Hubble. Um, and so it, it shows these neat lobes that are blowing out from a star that you actually can't see. There's a big disk of dust around the center that's absorbing all the starlight in the center. This image was data that I took uh, with the Keck telescope uh, with my mid-infrared camera on the ground where it's really hard to see stuff. Uh, but even so, you can trace the lobes of that planetary right down to the center. We still don't quite see the central star. That's, that's just a blob of dust. That's not the star itself. But there's, it's hard to see here, but there's also sort of a halo around it where that warm dust in the disk is glowing, emitting its own light. This is another planetary nebula. This one looks a little normal. It's kind of round and, you know, it's a little bubbly in the center, but it's fairly unremarkable. But when we looked at this planetary nebula with the WISE All-Sky Survey, we discovered that it had a pair of concentric rings around it. So how did that structure form? This also requires a binary star to shape it. And so we're still under, trying to understand just how does that work? What, what makes those shapes? And so I'd like to use Webb to get information about those rings, what they're composed of, what the energy situation is like, to see if we can understand a little bit better uh, what's going on with that planetary nebula. Okay, what's Webb's status and what's up next? So MIRI was the first instrument delivered. It was installed into the Science Instrument Module in 2013. And I do have to point out the detectors are on the backside and so you can't see them again. <sighs> All the instruments were on board by 2014, uh, within the, the year after that. And then it went through a number of rounds of testing. Uh, we wanted to make sure that the instruments all made it to the Goddard Space Flight Center in one piece. Uh, we wanted to make sure that the computers that are going to run the science instrument, mo I can't talk. science instrument module uh, were actually able to control the instruments. And you know, they went through a number of tests to make sure they'd survive launch and all that sort of stuff. Uh, just earlier this year, uh, you may have seen some of these pictures. The telescope itself was completed. Um, and then just a few months ago, that instrument module in the previous picture was lowered onto the backside of the telescope, so it was installed behind the primary mirror. And so that whole assembly is now ready to go through its own testing. Its next stop is actually the Johnson Space Flight Center down in Houston, where it will go into Chamber A. This is a huge vacuum chamber that was used during the Apollo missions, where they'd test the Apollo spacecraft. And in fact, they would throw people inside there, the astronauts, because they needed to train to work in a vacuum environment. So it's been repurposed uh, to test the Webb's telescope. This is what the telescope will look like inside the chamber. And then there are a bunch of light sources and other instruments up on the top to measure the properties of the optics of the telescope to make sure they're what they're supposed to be. We can't refurbish Webb, so it has to work the first time. Uh, so after the testing at Johnson, the telescope will make its way to Northrop Grumman, right down here in Redondo Beach. Um, the spacecraft, you know, that propulsion system and all that stuff, and the sun shield will be uh, bolted together. The telescope um, will then be connected with it, and we'll have a completed observatory. In early 2018, there'll be some short, it's probably still a couple of months, but a short functional test to make sure everything is ready to go. And then in October 2018, hopefully, we launch. And with any luck, you'll invite me back in about three years to give you a few of the first results. So that's it. I um, hope you learned a little bit, and I'd be happy to take questions.